Hello everyone, my name is Christian Steinmetz and I'm a PhD student at Queen Mary University of London. There I work in the Center for Digital Music along with Josh Rice. Today I want to talk to you about our AES convention paper titled Efficient Neural Networks for Real-Time Modeling of Analog Dynamic Range Compression. If you're interested, you can find the preprint of our paper on Archive or the AES library for the convention paper. So, as I'm sure you're aware, analog audio effects make up an important part of the audio engineering process. Analog effects are, cover a wide range of interesting sonic qualities and characteristics that are highly desirable by audio engineers, as well as some musicians, for example, in the context of guitar pedals and guitar amplifiers. So clearly there's something about this analog character that people like. While you can still get and buy used vintage equipment, it's often very expensive, very heavy, takes up a lot of space, and it's not fit very well into the current digital paradigm. And this motivates virtual analog modeling, which is basically an approach to create emulations that are digital of these analog effects. And this has been a very fruitful area of research and commercial products in the last 10 years or more, where there's now many commercially available plugins that emulate a large number of analog hardware. The problem, though, is that the creation of these emulations is very labor-intensive and requires expert knowledge. And this has motivated neural audio effects, essentially the process of using a neural network and a data set in order to automatically create emulations of audio effects. This generally works by taking some data set of recordings and playing them through some audio effect and recording the output. Then we can take a neural network and feed it these same input recordings and train it to output the same thing that was output by the real audio effect. We can use some loss function to measure the difference between the outputs of the real effect and our neural network, and then use back propagation in order to train the model as is common in machine learning. Additionally, we may also want to consider modeling the device control parameters. So then create a data set where we change these parameters and output, record the output at those different values, which we can then also feed those device parameters to the neural network to get it to adapt its behavior. And in this work, we're interested in the LA-2A compressor. So for example, I'm just going to give you an idea of what that might sound like here. First, we'll hear an input unprocessed piano recording. And now we'll hear the processed version with strong compression through the analog LA-2A compressor. But actually, that was our emulation you just listened to of the real analog LA-2A compressor using a neural network. And in this case, in our work, we were able to very closely capture the real LA-2A. And now you can compare the real output of the LA-2A here. And you should be able to notice that we very closely capture the dynamics as well as add almost no artifacts um, in the process of doing this emulation. But now let's talk a little bit about the related work and the previous work in this topic of analog modeling of dynamic range compression. So some work from Martinez Ramirez et al. looked at modeling the analog 1176 compressor. Unfortunately, while they got good results, they had some limitations in their work that they didn't consider the device parameters. They only considered guitar and bass signals and operated at 16 kilohertz, which limits the overall potential applicability of this approach more generally. There's also been a look at the LA-2A beyond our work, which first was looked at for, uh, by Holly et al. in 2019, where they introduced the signal train dataset and model, which was a new dataset of recordings from the LA-2A. And their model captured the device parameters, looked at many different types of sources, and operated at a high sample rate. But unfortunately, they found their proposed model had many artifacts that were quite detracting from the overall quality of the recording. And so in some work from my master's thesis, I looked at extending this with a temporal convolutional network to do the modeling um, of the LA-2A I used the same data set. And so similarly, we had the same kind of setup, but we were able to achieve far fewer artifacts um, and a very high quality emulation of the LA-2A. However, both of these models are, suffer from the same problem, which is that they're non-causal and not real-time because of their high computational complexity. And this really limits their applicability in real-world use cases. And that's what we aim to focus on in this, in this paper, is essentially adapting our previous work in order to make it 
feasible for real-time operation. Before we get into the details, just to give you the high-level overview of our contributions, we essentially propose a modified TCN, or Temporal Convolutional Network, for neural modeling with rapidly growing dilation factors. And this allows us to gain greater efficiency without much loss in performance. And so this leads to on par with state-of-the-art performance of the LA2A, real-time performance on CPU in a plugin, and the use of only 10 minutes of training data in order to get very high quality emulation, whereas previous approaches were using an entire data set of 20 hours of recording from the LA2A. So now I'll get in a little bit to some of the details of our approach. So as I mentioned, our approach is based around a temporal convolutional network or TCN, which is simply a neural network that uses one dimensional convolutions in order to process the audio directly at the waveform level. And the major component of the audio signal processing path is a series connection of TCN blocks. And each TCN block here is shown closer, and it's composed of these four components, the convolutional layer, batch normalization, film, and a parameterized ReLU. And there's additionally a residual connection that will connect the input to the output to allow some of the clean dry recording through at each block. And we can stack multiple of these blocks in series to make a deeper network, which will give us more parameters and more receptive field or more context in time. And in this case, the input waveform goes in at the top and the output waveform comes out at the end, which we want to be the emulation of the device. In order to adapt to the device control parameters, we use an MLP, which then projects these device control parameters to a linear layer at each layer of the TCN block, which then produces a gain and scaling parameter for each TCN. And this gets passed to the film operation, which will then modulate these activation functions and allow the network to adapt its behavior dynamically based on, on the settings of those parameters. And this was what we used in our previous work in order to model the analog LA2A. But as I mentioned before, our previous TCN-based approaches were non-causal. And as shown here in this diagram from the previous work, looking at WaveNet or TCN-based effects for denoising, the way that this works is that the context field or receptive field considers both future samples and previous samples in the computation of the current sample. So this prohibits, in some sense, real-time operation as there's always some high level of latency that's incurred by this non-causality. So one, one option is to simply use causal convolutions, which is what we adapt in our approach. And causal convolutions then mean that we only consider past samples. But this, doesn't, and this is not enough to make the model operate in real time, since we still, need high, we still need high efficiency in order to run enough samples in a block-based manner. And so what you'll notice is that the TCN also uses, rap, it uses dilation factors that grow as a power of two. And this allows us to increase the receptive field more efficiently in the TCN. And this is kind of the common practice to use a power of two. And so what we noticed is that the current approaches tend to use this power of two, which means that, for example, in our past work, we needed 10 layers in order to get a receptive field of about 300, which was the threshold at which we would get good performance. Some other papers have considered larger dilation factors in other contexts like speech processing. And a pow three, you know, power of three would give you the same receptive field at just six layers. But we found that that still wasn't enough for real-time operation. So what we did was go all the way to the extreme of a dilation factor that grows as a factor of 10. And this produced the same receptive field using only four layers, which we found would then achieve real-time operation. So this was the main idea in that we could make the network much, much, much more shallow and improve efficiency and therefore reduce the number of computations while retaining the same context size window. And to validate this, we performed a number of experiments looking at different dimensions of our approach. So we first looked at dilation growth. You know, can these models that have such dilated filters or very sparse filters actually work in practice? How does the model size impact performance? Could we just keep the same dilations that are small and just, in fact, use less parameters? Or can we also look at the data and say, how much data do we need in order to create a high quality emulation? For all of our experiments, we use the signal train data set provided by Holly et al. And we use the two control parameters in the data set for the mode and peak reduction of the LA2A. For more details on the training, I re refer you to the paper. And you can also check out on GitHub all of the code for our experiments if you're interested in reproducing them. So now on to the results. So in our first question, we wanted to know how did the dilation growth impact performance? Essentially, we first found that there was real no significant difference between the non-causal and causal formulations. It seems that the non-causal ones work slightly better, but not by significantly noticeable margins. What we did find is that using the dilation as a factor of 10, power of 10, 
worked almost as well, if not as well, as our previous model, which had many more parameters um, and was not capable of real-time operation. So this, case, this kind of validated our approach that TCNs with rapidly growing dilations actually produced models that were capable of much greater efficiency here. In this case, we're showing it about two times faster than real-time on CPU. Interestingly, we found also we tested against an LSTM um, in the same task, and we found that this model actually performed very well um, across the STFT and the LDFS error. But what we found was that in the PyTorch implementation we were using for all of these models, it was not capable of real-time operation. However, some other works have shown that specialized C++ implementations can, in fact, achieve real-time operation for this kind of model, which is another area of interest um, for audio effect modeling. However, we found that even, even if that's the case, training this LSTM took 10 times longer than training our TCN-based approach. And so that's another thing to consider when looking at these two models. We trained a number of models of the original non-causal variant at 32, 16, and 8 channels. And each of these would then be reducing the number of parameters. And so while we found that, for example, using 16 channels produced real-time operation of the model, the performance decreased significantly as we made the model small. Whereas if we used our model with 32 channels and very sparse convolutional kernels, we were able to get almost exactly the same, you know, even better performance in the mean, in the mean absolute error, but somewhat worse in STFT, but by a small margin. And essentially decreasing the model size doesn't improve efficiency, but hurts performance. Whereas our approach using rapidly growing dilation factors gets almost the same performance, but with less compute. So finally, our last experiment looked at the impact of the data set size. How much data do we need in order to get good performance? And essentially what we found here was very interesting, which was that we didn't really notice a significant difference using any of the subsets of the data set. So using 100%, 10%, or just 1% of the data didn't have a significant impact on the performance that we found. Further work is needed to validate um, exactly these results, but in our experiments, um, we found that using just 1% of the data set produced very comparable results, which amounts to just 11 minutes of data. So as I was saying, these objective metrics don't tell the whole story. And for this reason, we performed a perceptual listening study with 18 participants. We designed a mushroom-like study where the listeners were asked to rate the similarity of the different models to the reference recording from the real analog LA2A. And what we found at first was that the TCN and the LSTM performed pretty close to the reference, but were still distinguishable by the listeners after our statistical evaluation of the results. That being said, there were some cases where listeners were not able to differentiate, and you can actually see this in the large um, variance of the ratings of the reference. Sometimes the reference was rated lower than the other models, for example. However, what was clear was that our TCN and LSTM models certainly outperformed the signal train approach by a large margin, and that's largely due to the strong artifacts that were present in a lot of those signal train recordings. And if you're interested in hearing these listening examples from the test, you can go onto this website here and hear them for yourself along with more. As I wrap up a little bit, I want to talk again about the major contributions. Essentially, we proposed a modified TCN architecture with these rapidly growing dilation factors to get better efficiency without hurting performance, led us to on-par performance with the state of the art, real-time operation on CPU, and used only 10 minutes of training data in the process. And before I wrap up, I just want to mention some future directions of research for any of those interested in continuing in this um, area. I think one clear direction is to have more generalized models across many effects, modeling all of their control parameters, which is a hard task. Also, models that are capable of sample rate invariance that can be trained at one sample rate and then modified to different sample rates would be very useful. Also, blind audio effect modeling is an interesting task that has not been investigated a lot, but this essentially means that you can only observe the output recording and your neural network then has to create a model based only on that. So you could then imagine how this could be useful for, for example, mimicking someone's tone from a recording, even though you don't have their clean, dry recording. And finally, another topic that I've been very interested in in my PhD that's related to this is the generation of novel audio effects using neural networks. So to give you some examples of that, one of the first works we looked at was using random neural networks in order to create audio effects. And in this case, we found that taking a TCN and just setting the weights to random values produced really interesting distortion effects. So here's one quick example where you'll hear a guitar, and at first you'll hear with no effects applied, and then we'll activate some neural networks to process the audio using totally random networks with no training. And 
And while we found this produced really interesting results, we were interested in extending this work to make the process of finding interesting audio effects easier. And that's what our steerable discovery of neural audio effects was about. Essentially, we proposed a method where a user could supply their own recording of an audio effect that they wanted to mimic, but in an interesting way. And then after training for some small amount of time, we could then use this new neural audio effect that was kind of a crude emulation to produce interesting effects. And they could even use these control parameters that we provide to extrapolate to different effects that were variations of this effect. And that concludes my talk. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any questions about any details, please feel free to reach out via email. If you're interested in following more of our work, follow me on Twitter, where I will post many updates. Again, the paper is available on Archive. The webpage has all of these details and more. The code is available on GitHub. And there's also a CoLab notebook that was put together by Scott Hawley that uses our TCN model for different audio effect modelings that you can check out yourself. Thank you so much for joining, and I hope you enjoy the conference.